Good afternoon. I'm very happy to be able to welcome you to, to the IHC's Humanities Decanted series. We created this series to provide a platform for humanities and arts faculty to share their newest interdisciplinary scholarly and creative work with the campus and the public. My name is Susan Derwin, and I'm the director of the Interdisciplinary Humanities Center. Our conversation today will last for about 30 minutes, after which we will take audience questions for 10 minutes. At any time during the event, you can use the Q&A feature on your screen to submit your questions. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the Chumash people, who are the traditional custodians of the land upon which the Interdisciplinary Humanities Center is located. And I would like to pay respect to elders, both past and present. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce our interlocutors, Professors Patrick McRae and Alan Liu. Patrick McRae researches and teaches the histories of technology and science. Trained as a scientist, he earned his PhD in material science and engineering from the University of Arizona. He has written or edited numerous books, including Visioneers, How an Elite Group of Scientists Pursued Space Colonies, Nanotechnologies, and a Limitless Future, which received the Watson Davis Prize in 2014 from the History of Science Society as the best book written for a general audience. Today, he will be speaking with us about his newest book, which came out at the end of last year with MIT Press, Making Art Work, How Cold War Engineers and Artists Forged a New Creative Culture. And Patrick will be speaking with Professor Alan Liu, distinguished professor in the English department. Professor Liu began his career as a scholar of British Romantic literature and art, and then moved through the field of cultural criticism into the study of information culture. His most recent book is Friending the Past, The Sense of History in the Digital Age. It is my pleasure to welcome my colleagues Patrick McRae and Alan Liu to the virtual IHC to converse about Patrick's new book. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susan. I'm gonna get the screen share going here. Perfect. So I can't think of a better place to talk about this new book or a better person to talk with about it than uh, Alan. Uh, so really thanks to the IHC for organizing this. Uh, like Susan said, at the end of last year, MIT Press published my new book called Making Art Work. And in the next uh, five to seven minutes, I'd like to tell you a little bit about it. So the book starts in the early 1960s as artists and engineers in the United States and overseas launched a series of creative collaborations. And in doing so, they adopted a range of diverse strategies to foster partnerships with each other, to secure resources and to reach a diverse array of audiences. A good deal of the rhetoric justifying these activities was drawn from C.P. Snow's famous diagnosis of the divide between the so-called two cultures. But this movement to bring art and technology together was neither monolithic nor united, but together these creative efforts burst forth from corporate laboratories, artists, lofts, publishing houses, museum galleries, and university campuses. The scale of these collaborations varied widely. Some were one-on-one -on -one personal collaborations, such as this partnership shown here between engineer Billy Kluver, who worked normally at Bell Labs, and artist Robert Rauschenberg. Here they're shown working on Rauschenberg's piece called Oracle, which was a sculptural work that also incorporated wireless radio transmitters inside of it that Kluver and Rauschenberg built to recreate the sounds of a city on a hot summer's day. Kluver and Rauschenberg would also go on to co-found the organization Experiments in Art and Technology in 1966. EAT, as it was known, was probably the uh, best publicized and uh, largest of these uh, large-scale formal efforts to bring artists and engineers together. For about five years, EAT partnered artists with engineers generating what were sociological as well as artistic and technological um, experiments. The goal of many of these activities was not so much product or process. Artist-engineer collaborations were understood as experiments in creativity that could benefit the art world as well as industry patrons. For engineers um, who were often critiqued at this time for their complicity in the Vietnam War or environmental destruction, participation with artists and the marriage of art and technology was a chance to humanize technology and also to redefine their profession, if only on the personal level. At the other end of the scale, we have efforts like the Pepsi Pavilion, which debuted at Expo 70 in Osaka, Japan, the first World's Fair held in Asia. Uh, 
If you were to go to the pavilion outside of it, you would encounter a dome-like building that would be shrouded in a veil of artificial fog and dramatically lit at night by high intensity lights. Inside, tens of thousands of people who visited Expo 70 could make their own sensory experience inside the pavilion, interacting with a complex array of visual effects as well as optical and auditory illusions. Building things like the pavilion required the effort of scores of artists and engineers. The pavilion itself cost the equivalent of something like $15 million in today's money. We can think of it sort of as the art world's version of big science. Writing about the Pepsi Pavilion was actually one of uh, my favorite parts of uh, writing my book. But when writing a book, one of the big challenges is deciding what to put in and what to leave out. Um, how do you present um, what you have while uh, creating a project that won't cause your editor to freak out when they see the size of your manuscript? But another challenge also occurs after you finish the project and you learn about something or someone that you wish you had been able to include. When my book was in the final stages of page proofs, I learned uh, more about this person, uh, an artist by the name of Frederick Eversley, and I wanted to say something about him because his story in many ways is emblematic, not just about the history of art and technology, but also about the history of post-war California. Eversley was born in 1941 in New York City. His father was an engineer and businessman from Barbados. Frederick Eversley uh, trained as an engineer, getting his degree from Carnegie Mellon University in 1963. And then like so many engineers, Eversley migrated to California for a job in the booming aerospace sector. It is easy to forget today how central aerospace was to our state's economy at that point in time. Eversley's company, uh, in which he eventually became a senior engineer, did testing for NASA and other companies um, who had Apollo era contracts. Now, Eversley lived in Venice Beach, and he found himself living amidst a thriving art scene with many members of the California light and space movement, people like James Terrell and Robert Irwin and Larry Bell, who were his friends and neighbors. And in 1967, after a near fatal car accident, Eversley decided to take a break from his engineering job and he began making art. He soon began to turn out works of art that he fabricated from new space age plastics and other materials lenses, wedges, and other shapes cast in plastic resin in an array of hues and colors. Now, Eversley also participated in one of the era's largest art and engineering efforts. This was the art and technology program organized at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, started in 1967 by Maurice Tuckman, a brash young new curator from New York. Enticed by the technological opportunities that Southern California offered, Tuckman embarked on an ambitious program to uh, get artists to partner with the region's high-tech corporations. And for five years, Tuckman coordinated an unruly ensemble of artists, engineers, and company managers for his art and technology program, the results of which was a notorious 1971 exhibit. LACMA's art and technology exhibition premiered in 1971, 50 years ago this year, and it catalyzed a visceral reaction. There was hostility from artists about the lack of representation of women or people of color. Almost all of the artists that Tuckman brought into the program came from New York City. And meanwhile, cultural critics blasted artists who they said had compromised themselves by collaborating with engineers and corporations. By the mid 1970s, this first wave of art and technology appeared uh, discredited and as out of fashion as moon landings and other techno utopian projects launched in the mid 1960s. Now, one of my book's main arguments is that enthusiasm for art and technology activities comes in waves. This first one that I've just described to you ended in the early 1970s. A new wave began to emerge around 1985 as corporations like Xerox and Microsoft started artist in residence programs. And while phrases like creative disruption saturated management literature in the 1990s, the idea that artists could help spark new commercial innovation took hold. By the end of the 1990s, Dozens of art and technology programs and departments, several within the UC system alone, existed at universities in the United States and throughout the world. I believe we're in the midst of a new wave of art and science and art and technology activity today. National education leaders have praised the value of adding art and design to traditional uh, science, technology, engineering, and math uh, framework, this sometimes branded as STEM to STEAM while uh, museums like LACMA and the Getty have launched or relaunched art and technology programs. 
Taken together, I think these histories from the 1960s, the 1990s, and today remind us again how art and technology and artist and engineer are dynamic and culturally evolving enterprises. Ultimately, I see the book that I wrote as highlighting the ways in which engineers and artists display their expertise, display their creativity by making art work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. And uh, the first thing I should say as a respondent and interviewer here is to congratulate you on the book. I really enjoyed reading it. For those of you in the audience who have not yet read the book, uh, I recommend that when you get it, turn to the end and look at the notes on sources to see how remarkably deep and broad uh, Patrick's research was through public and public uh, private archives, uh, centers, organizations, um, oral histories. And then you'll recognize how well shaped and told his story is when you begin reading chapter by chapter based on that research. So Patrick, I have a number of questions for you. Um, we'll probably not get to all of them. The first question comes from that side of me, which is not a humanities scholar, but originally the son of an engineer. This actually is my dad's slide room, his favorite uh, Castell slide room from the pre-digital age of structural engineering. He was a structural engineer and uh, one of the chief engineers of the World Trade Center. So Patrick, your book is on art and technology where technology is the key word and not science. Some of the freshest, most important work that you do, for example, in chapter two in particular, is to recover in richly researched detail what you call the sensibility of the engineer as a cultural type in the post-Cold War era from Sputnik on in the 60s, a type brought up within a complex mesh of educational, economic, social, and other institutions that actually went against type for being curious enough to collaborate with artists. Jump to the present. By way of stark contrast, I found this Reddit post from last year in the subreddit Engineering Students. The post is titled, Engineering Has Changed My Personality and I Don't Like Who I Am Becoming. I'll just read a bit of it for the flavor. As a stereotypical engineering student, I began my engineering path with great expectations for all the things I'd be able to accomplish with an engineering degree. I was ready to dive headfirst into all the difficult classes engineering had to offer in the hopes of coming out more knowledgeable on topics that could potentially help me leave a positive footprint on the world, no matter how small. You know, my biggest dream was to be able to build or create something, anything, no matter the size that I could point to and tell my children, your dad did that. As I progressed through my engineering path, all the stress, all the late nights, all the hard work resulted in mediocre results that have succeeded in turning that optimistic kid with big dreams into an emotionless robot. I was a happy, optimistic, empathetic person. Engineering has turned me into a bitter, cynical, and selfish one. I don't like what I'm turning into, close quote. Patrick, what do you think is the key lesson that your book on the history of art and technology collaborations offers this engineering student, or more generally educational programs, companies, and society about, let's call it the inner life of engineering mm. and how it can both enrich or be enriched by social and cultural life? So Alan, I, I see that you arrived bringing the happiness. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, you know, the comment that you read, um, you know, makes me quite sad. Um, it reflects a lot of my own thoughts and feelings that I had as an engineering student as um, in the 1980s, and ultimately reflects some of my own experiences of why I left engineering and am now a humanities professor. Um, that said, um, I think we can as you know, members of a university recognize that engineers are creative individuals. This is something that I grappled with as part of um, writing that section on the engineer's sensibility, as you note. Um, I think it's also important to recognize that this um, sense of malaise that you um, describe this student having is not new. This is something that engineering education experts have been working on since the 1950s mm -hmm. and these sort of periodic attempts to reinvent, re-engineer the engineering curriculum. The answer always is to increase the amount of liberal arts exposure that engineering students get, but the question always is how do you do this and still graduate people in four years? Um, a personal aside, I think one path to accomplish this is to have a greater focus on courses in things like engineering ethics, 
um, that are less about big philosophical issues in, in ethics and are rather grounded on like real world case studies, contemporary as well as historical. And if not engineering ethics, maybe we could start with engineering and empathy, sort of going to what you were saying about this student feeling like a, a soulless robot. I think if you could add some empathy into that um, equation, um, you might end up with a, a, a set of different feelings. And at that point, of course, we enter endless curricular planning sessions about where you would fit that into an engineering curriculum today, given how crowded it, it is. Yeah. Let me go on to uh, another question. You probably know that this question is coming and uh, prepared yourself mentally for it uh, from critics and others. This is the, is it art question? So hurt is a verb, and I like the title of your, of your book, hurt is a verb, the last word in your book's title, making art work refers not just to engineering sensibility, the engineers wish to make anything just work, but also to a reorientation in general away from art as aesthetics. You know, for example, that Billy Kluber's disinterest in delineating art from technology or adjudicating good art from bad would become central to EAT's strategy of ignoring aesthetic judgments in favor of supporting the collaborative process itself. And indeed, when I read your book, I kept marking passages in which your, your own consistent position is that when considering art and technology, aesthetic evaluations of the final artworks as products is irrelevant. As you say, and this is on page eight, many of the art critics, curators, and journalists who responded to the art and technology movement stubbornly kept their gaze on the products of artist engineer collaborations. The most fundamental level, the question was, is it art? And then your position is this, I am not concerned with such adjudication. What interests me more is not the art objects themselves, fascinating as they often are, but rather the activities that brought them into existence, close quote. So I'm gonna pose this in the most challenging way I can to you. And that's by way of raising the issue from the level of aesthetics in itself to that of evaluation generally. I think it's possible to see that the aesthetic judgments that society has had have always functioned as indexes of larger systems of value. So when Plato dissed all art as distortions of the ideal forms, or Aristotle thought that good art was an imitation of nature, you can see that whole cascading series of value judgments lie behind that. So here's my question. If aesthetic value is not the right framework for evaluating art and technology work, then what is the more appropriate framework that the art and technology movements were helping us evolve for modern society? That is, if art and technology is neither good nor bad art, then what kind of good or bad is it? All right, tossing out the softball questions, I see. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the great things in researching and writing this book was getting the opportunity to learn just a little bit at least about the fields of art and art history. That said, um, you know, I'm not an expert on aesthetics. And as you point out, and as I strenuously point out in the book, I have no interest in adjudicating good art from bad art. Um, what was of huge interest to me in um, researching this book and thinking about what I wanted to say was reading Howard Becker's classic uh, book, um, Art Worlds, which is sort of his sociology of the art community and his focus on all the various people, not just the artists and the curators, but all the different people who make the art world work was fascinating to me and also reflected my own focus in my own work on technological, um, technological communities uh, broadly construed. Uh, coming back more directly to your question, uh, my historical actors that I write about were much more concerned, as you note, with process rather than product, and the book obviously reflects that. And then sort of bringing in my background in the history of science, um, in the history of science, we're not so concerned with whether something is good science, but more as to whether it's science mm -hmm. in the first place, uh, sort of a classic question about demarcation. Um, and the demarcation question is an important one, but it's not usually thought of in terms of values so much. Um, in this sense, as an art, um, you know, art is good to think with. And coming back to what is it good for, good, bad, whatever, in working on this, again, as I had to draw the box around my own project, um, you know, I had to come up with my own definition of what I was going to consider as art to include. And I was really intrigued by the things that appealed to me were works of art that surprised me, 
um, the things that I would see or learn about that would show me something new about the world. Um, and I think for the cases of art and technology, I think some of the best pieces um, were the ones that offered real substantive critiques of technology itself. So those are sort of the criteria that I had as, as I was working on this that at least on a personal level were of importance to me. Yeah, just a yeah, short commentary. Um, I would be very interested in seeing a comparison of how uh, artworks are evaluated in the early 20th century, the you know, avant-garde movements, et cetera, versus the later 20th century. Yeah. Or again, and it's fascinating question is uh, exactly how does art get hooked up with questions of evaluation? Because it inevitably does. Like right now, uh, people are talking about using Bitcoin to assign unique value to digital artworks that make them collectible, right? And therefore viable in different ways. So, I, I was just thinking about that where, I mean, the valuation is so direct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you mentioned STEAM earlier as uh, a, a kind of a wrap up of the sequence of waves of art and technology movements that your book charts out. You concentrate mostly on the so-called long 60s, uh, the early art and technology movements having to do with Billy Kluver and Eat with Frank Molina and what became the Leonardo community with Maurice Tuckman and the art and technology program at LACMA. And um, you also mentioned, for example, Georgie Kepe's Center for Advanced Visual Studies at MIT. Then you move on to talk about a second wave, um, for example, uh, Nicholas Negroponte and the MIT Media Lab. And then you kind of prophecy about the third wave that is coming out right now um, here at UCSB, for example, you mentioned MAT, our Media Arts and Technology program. And you frame this, as you put it earlier, in terms of uh, the new ethos of STEAM, where the initial A for art is crammed in there among the initials for STEM, uh, science, technology engineering and mathematics. Not all of what you say about STEAM is glowing and positive. So I just wanted to ask, what do you think that the artists, engineers and organizers you studied in the art and technology movements of the past would think about STEAM today? Or put another way, what can STEAM learn from the movements that you historicize? I think people who were active at the art and technology interface 50 years ago would be really surprised today to see how institutionalized art and technology became. Um, you know, there are something like eight different programs, centers, what have you, just within the UC system alone. Um, but those older initiatives were much more from the bottom up, whereas a lot of this initiative for STEM to STEAM today is coming more in a top-down sort of way. So I think that would have probably been surprising to people 50 years ago. Um, I think they would caution us to be aware of balance. One of the really strong messages that Billy Kluver and Experiments in Art and Technology had, which not all of these formal efforts adopted, was that the artist and the engineer should more or less be on equal footing. That um, while the art critics might not recognize the engineer or name them in their write-up of the gallery show or whatever, at least um, within EAT, within the, the, the museum catalogs or whatever, the artist and the engineer received um, more or less equal billing. And I think that's something that balance is something that is missing in some ways in these STEM to STEAM initiatives. And this is a concern that I raise in my book that STEM to STEAM or adding art to STEM fields tends to operationalize the arts and humanities in a way. Um, you know, it's, you know, there's maybe some unequal benefits that are happening there. And I think a lot of what comes out of art and technology today, based on a lot of my conversations with museum curators, is also concern about this, uh, uh, th this sort of impetus to create works of art that have a lot of public appeal, that are very Instagrammable, that will draw sort of immediate attention to the museum or to the gallery show. Um, you know, going back to your comment about my own sort of uh, somewhat jaundiced view of STEM to STEAM, you know, I'm reminded of that, uh, you know, of a National Academy of Sciences meeting I went to five or six years, well, probably five years ago now, you know, where everybody in the room was from arts, humanities, science, technology, everybody was there, but the meeting started with somebody, you know, getting up and telling a joke about, you know, a lifeboat and you've got an artist, an engineer and humanist and uh, an artist, you know, in board and you've got two life jackets, complete the joke. And everybody in the room laughed, but it was pretty clear who was going to be feeding the fishes. 
Yeah, and if we had more time, I'd want to ask you about where humanities get, can get fit into the STEAM acronym as well. Yeah. I've got another question, and this is, I think, one that must be asked now in the year 2021. Um, you've already alluded to these kinds of issues in your opening presentation. One aspect of the art and technology movements and events that you do not look away from in your book is that they were largely a white men's club, primarily and sometimes exclusively white male artists, with the exclusion of a few people, that the you know, exception of a few people like the one you showed earlier. Um, this came in for critique at the time as also the fact that uh, you know, many of these uh, collaborative movements uh, hooked up with uh, industries that made their money from the military industrial complex. Today in 2021, of course, concern with social justice is peaking again with an urgency comparable to that of the civil rights and anti-war movements of the exact period of time that your book is about when the art and technology movements were taking place. If you were starting your book now in the wake of the past year, is there anything that you think you would do differently in choosing what to research or what to emphasize in the history of the art and technology movements of that earlier era? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, well, you know, in writing and researching the book, um, you know, I think I did the most with the material that I had access to. Um, the world of the artists, as well as the engineer in the mid 1960s, um, you know, there were many parallels between those worlds, and one of them was that it was largely white and largely male, um, at least as reflected in the historical record with regard to art and technology. Um, and writing the book, I looked for as much diversity and representation as I could find in what the historical record um, would, would bear. In, you know, to sort of go back and do it again, um, there are definitely places in the book where I would spend a little bit more time thinking more closely about works of art that were that offered more critiques of technology that was a part that um, you know was in there in original drafts and then you know gradually got diluted and you know not everything makes it to the final um, the final product but the main thing i wish i had focused on was you know maybe less around social issues although to be fair even if the art and technology movement was um, not so diverse in its demographic makeup it certainly shared a lot of the same aspirations and goals, um, you know, of those other social movements of the era that you described. So, you know, there is that. But I, I do wish I had focused more in the book on art and the environment. Um, mm -hmm. When this wave, this first wave of activity ends in the early 1970s, this was the time when there was a lot of really interesting stuff beginning to happen around environmental arts and eco art. And this was something I, you know, again, was aware of, but it just didn't make it into the final version. Um, and it was something for a while I was considering doing as a, as a next book project. And I'm still kind of, you know, fuzzy on what's going to happen with that, um, in part just because of, you know, access to archives due to COVID and that sort of thing. Um, but I, I wish I'd focused a little bit more on that eco art technology um, in interface. And if I might suggest um, another direction for future research, whether by you or by someone else, would have to do with um, immigrant communities of engineers in this nation. You know, I was recently involved in a, by invitation at a event at Google called Google at Humanities. They have an initiative where they're bringing in academics to talk to them about uh, ethics and uh, inclusion issues, uh, et cetera. And one of the things I wrote up for them is the fact that, uh, look, you've got a large sitting pool of uh, South Asian and East Asian immigrant engineers in particular, what are you think doing thinking about what are you thinking about uh, ways to include their culture and their history as part of your engineering culture might that be a way to uh, extend the dis discussion about uh, inclusion yeah and to be fair i mean two of the major characters in my book billy kluver um you know came to the united states from sweden and Georg uh, georgie kepish came from um hungary and Frank Molina had very, very close ties to Czechoslovakia and pretty much considered himself, you know, yeah. equal American as he was Czech. So that immigrant story, you know, very much part of yeah. part of that. Well, at this point, we've run out of time. I had more questions. Uh, and my next question was going to be about the, the genealogy of arts and technology at UCSB. We won't have time for that. Uh, we've already mentioned MAT, but I just wanted to give a shout out to my early days here when I arrived 30 or so years ago. Victoria Vesna was an artist here, and yeah. uh, she has started a lab at the art department called EAT, which, as I recall, stood for um, Electronic Arts and Technology. 
really nifty kind of uh, allusion back to the original experiments in art and technology. And of course, that uh, EAT acronym still survives in UCSB's CREATE, Center yeah. for Research in Electronic Art and Technology. But we yeah, won't have very time much, to. Very much part of that um, 1990s wave. Yeah. Okay, thank you. That was just wonderful. Uh, and let's launch into some questions. Uh, the first question I have from an audience member concerns policy. Uh, the balance of collaboration between art and science is not balanced. Please discuss a governmental policy shift that could be done to increase a merging between NEA and NSF. And first of all, do you advocate for something like that? And what would you imagine uh, this marriage would spawn? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, there certainly have been conversations between various, you know, federal agencies about doing this. I mean, the thing that I mentioned, the anecdote at the National Academy of Sciences was a meeting between the heads of the NEA, the NEH, people from the National Science Foundation, the people from the National Academy. Um, what ultimately came out of that was a um, National Academy of Sciences study called um, uh, branches from the same tree or something like that, something rather anodyne that the uh, secretary then of the Smithsonian Institution uh, coordinated. And, you know, it offered a whole raft of different, um, you know, policy uh, suggestions and things like that. Um, but again, this was a very top-down sort of approach to making this happen, whereas a lot of the efforts that I write about in the book came from these um, you know, one-on-one -on -one partnerships and collaborations between artists and engineers, and um, you know, then some of these large, formal, uh, corporate-funded sorts of initiatives. You know, that having been said, I mean, the National Science Foundation has artists in residence programs, and you know, lots of the big tech companies, for better or for worse, we could say something about that. You know, Facebook, Autodesk, whatever, have artists in residence programs as well. There's also, of course, the question of, you know, what is the purpose? Why, why do those programs exist? And what do the artists get out of it? And, and what do the, the companies get out of it? And just to add that, uh, you know, I completely agree that uh, the leverage point for this discussion has to do with the top-down approach. Where does the funding come from? The fact that our country, unlike Canada, for example, Canada has uh, the SHRC Council, uh, Social Sciences and Humanities. The UK has equivalents of that. The fact that the humanities and arts are cut off from both the social sciences and the sciences in our funding apparatus has distorting effects on the kind of research that, that can occur. The very fact in and of itself that the NEA is separate from the NEH has a distorting effect in that regard. No, that's a great point, Alan. All right, um, could you speak more about the geopolitical role of these artist engineer collaborations in the context of the Cold War? What vision of American exceptionalism did these international collaborations promulgate, or did they serve to undermine this ideology? Well, that's a great question. I think in many ways they did. Uh, you know, they they you know they were very diverse, so you, you can't just sort of lump them all into sort of having one set of agenda. Um, I guess I would go to the um, Expo seventy at Osaka that I mentioned. So, um, you know, what I left out of that story, so you've got the Pepsi Pavilion, which is this large, you know, effort that Pepsi funds for about, you know, for several million dollars that EAT is involved with. But the United States also had a pavilion there. And Maurice Tuckman took his art and technology show from Los Angeles, actually before it showed in Los Angeles, uh, it actually premiered at the US Pavilion um, in 1970 there. And, um, you know, it's a very interesting sort of thing to look at because it was, you have art and technology there on display with very traditional artworks from the Metropolitan Museum of Art that were on loan. Also with the, um, you know, various Apollo um, lunar program artifacts, you know, moon rocks were on display and things like that, that were there. Um, you know, so in one sense that was art and technology being presented as an example of American creativity and um, you know, sort of this bringing together in a very sort of flexible and adaptive sort of way of artists and engineers in a way that you would not have seen at the Soviet pavilion, for example, there. Um, you know, at the same time, some of the artists who were involved with um, these efforts, the one that comes to mind right off the top of my head is Carolee Schneeman, um, who was a performance artist who 
1967 did a performance piece called Snows uh, that she did in collaboration with EAT. And it was an explicit in all senses of the word, um, you know, critique of American involvement in Vietnam. So, you know, that there, there's a range here in terms of, you know, participating in sort of presenting the United States to the world, but also um, critiquing its uh, various geopolitical um, positions. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, another audience member asked something related. I think you've covered it, unless you wanna say anything broader. The question is about the political messages of the art and how the artist and engineer collaborations envisioned the import of their pieces. But I think anything further you wanna say about that? Um, I mean, I guess the, the main thing I would say is that in the 1960s, there was a huge focus on creativity. Um, there were studies done by the National Science Foundation to try to inculcate greater creativity within the scientific community, that you get this sense in the 1960s that scientific creativity at least was something that was um, being studied and promoted and stockpiled even like nuclear weapons that you might be able to deploy um, at, at some point in time. So, you know, that's kind of the ways in which I suppose, um, you know, I came to it at least in terms of thinking about this, this. And then of course, the whole question about, you know, are engineers creative and how is their creativity different from that of scientists? And, you know, that at least for me was, you know, an interesting part of, of working on this project. So let me just ask you a follow-up question to that. Um, I was interested in uh, the kind of juxtaposition of two things you said. On the one hand, you talked about the way art and technology collaborations historically come in waves. Uh, and then though you move to a discussion of uh, the reasons for the, as being sort of more existential, you know, the engineer's malaise. And I was wondering if you could, re returning to this sort of cyclical uh, structure you're seeing, what pressures or forces are, or can we see these collaborations as responding to? I mean, is there anything less individualist, anything going on in the world, sort of certain exigencies that generate this kind of response other than individual expansion or fulfillment or? Yeah. No, I mean, not to be a vulgar materialist, but I think ultimately it comes down to economics. I don't think it's a coincidence that this boom of art and technology activity happens during a period of unparalleled prosperity in the Western world. Um, when you have companies like AT&T, which, you know, supported, you know, which was, you know, Bell Labs was an offshoot of that and all these other various companies that were doing extremely well, um, you know, business-wise, and they had the slack in their system, so to speak, to support these efforts at the same time that engineers were highly sought after. I mean, if you had a engineering degree, especially an advanced degree, in the mid 1960s, you know, as maybe you know, some of Alan's own family history could speak to, you really could write your own ticket. And a lot of these companies looked to ways to basically keep engineers um, to stay at their firms. And you know, they did all sorts of things to do this. You know, additional um, professional training things, so they would always sort of be at the top of their game building a golf course nearby so the engineers would have something to do on the weekend or allowing them to or encouraging them to partner with artists. So in some sense, this was a way of keeping employees happy in the way that we see in Silicon Valley now with, you know, beanbag chairs and sushi bars. Um, but when you get to the early 70s and the Nixon era recession, all of a sudden that boom time isn't quite what it was. And as engineers are being laid off in droves, the ones that kept their jobs, you can imagine the reticence to go to your company manager and say, I'd really like to partner with an artist to make some art. That probably would not have been a wise career move at that point. You know, jump to the 80s, the, the run up to the dot com boom through the 1990s. And again, I don't really find it a coincidence that this focus on STEM to STEAM happened in the uh, wake of the Great Recession. I mean, you really begin to see the pressure for it mounting in. 2010. I don't see that as a coincidence. I see that as a direct reflection of economics. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, how about the question of the motivations of engineers to work with artists? Did they see it as a way to expand their own worldviews or just do something different? And are there any outcomes on the engineering side resulting from the collaboration? 
No, that's a great question. And again, one of the things that was fascinating about working at this is there's such a spectrum of reasons for why people did it. Um, some did it because their managers told them to. You know, you're here, you're doing this thing for the next six months, you're collaborating with this artist. Um, some did it because they wanted to, you know, feel a greater participation in a larger humanities oriented exercise. You know, some people felt sort of like that engineer that Alan referred to at the beginning here, you know, somewhat deadened by their job of, you know, making missiles and weapon systems and they wanted to do something um, that was different. Some wanted to have a different outlet for their creativity. And some, quite frankly, did it for social reasons. I mean, you're talking about engineers who are working within a largely male community, and this was an opportunity to meet uh, to meet new people. And there were definitely some hookups and marriages that arose um, out of this. And you know, it's a range of reasons. All right, this will be your last question. Okay. Uh, when exactly did engineering become divorced from art and design so that the collaborations you document seem so revolutionary? It seems that some sense of design and aesthetics would be important, for example, if you were engineering a car and somewhat counterintuitive that engineers would not study at least some art and design. No, great idea. And again, this is sort of one of the things that was fascinating was, again, going back to this idea of the engineer's sensibility, the sense of creativity. And yes, especially if you were an engineer trained in the 30s or 40s, you would take classes in drafting and design, of course, is an essential part of being an engineer. I mean, this is one of the reasons why I think the pairing of art and technology makes so much more sense than the pairing of art and science, because art and technology both together are forward-looking activities, if you will. They're both about conceptualizing, designing something, making something, um, imagining what it's going to become. Um, so that is very much a parallel that you see between these communities, I suppose. So I don't really, you know, the, the sense of aesthetics and design that engineers had, again, you know, artists and engineers are producing very different things. But again, in these collaborations that, I'm, that I speak of, one of the great things is that, and one of the reasons why I focused on these particular collaborations, because they were so large scale, they left behind a huge documentary record. So from that record, you can get a signal, if you will, of what the engineers were doing, what they were thinking about that you couldn't get necessarily from a lot of the one-on-one -on -one interactions. And from that, you get a sense of how the artists and engineers viewed one another and how they sort of began to reconcile their own previously disparate approaches to things like creativity and aesthetics and design. And it's, you know, it was a process in many ways of, of learning how to communicate with each other. Well, Patrick, Alan, I think that we are all going to buy this book immediately now. And <laughs> it's just a rich and palette wedding discussion. Uh, thank you both so much. Uh, thank you to our audience members for uh, being here, for submitting such good questions. And uh, I look forward to seeing everybody again at the next Humanities Decanted and eventually back at the IHC where we will indeed raise our glasses. Yes, Alan? <laughs> Before we go, can I ask my softball question for Patrick and get just a one word answer or two one word, word answer. Patrick, what was your favorite part of your book? Um, Two things, very quickly. One, um, as a university employee, writing about some of the skullduggery that went on behind the scenes um, at the Media Lab as it was being created, uh, um, to see like true academic backstabbing um, preserved <laughs> in the historical record was pretty awesome. <laughs> um, and as a scholar, I think it was the opportunity to draw comparisons between the world of the engineer and the world of the artist in the 1960s in a way that I don't think anyone had done before, at least not to my knowledge, that I found very rewarding and, and also a little subversive. So those were the two things that I very much enjoyed. As is good interdisciplinary cross-cultural work. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much and uh, good night. Good night.